Good evening. Before we come on to our main theme this evening, I really must say something about Mars, because exciting things are happening there. The Sojourner rover is crawling around, sending back superb data, and has now been joined by a second mission, Mars Global Surveyor, which has reached the planet and is now in orbit around Mars. It's been put into a very eccentric orbit, and over the next few months, that will change, become a low-type circular orbit, and then the main scientific work will begin. And already, some pictures have come back, and clearly, it's working very well. The aims, well, first of all, to provide excellent maps of the planet, and secondly, uh, to search for areas where water may once have been, and thirdly, to prospect for areas for landing future probes. And all seem to be going well, and of course, we'll keep you fully informed. But uh, meanwhile, let's now turn to our main theme, the Cassini-Huygens probe, a joint mission from the European Space Agency and from NASA. And that's you to go, not to Mars, but to the ringed planet Saturn. And Saturn, you can now see in the evening sky, looking like a fairly bright star. Nothing like so brilliant as Jupiter, but brilliant enough. And telescopically, that shows the lovely system of rings, unlike anything else in the solar system. That was a sketch I made a few nights ago with my own telescope. You see there the yellowish, flattened globe, and the rings, which are made up of millions of tiny, icy particles, all spinning around Saturn like tiny moons. And look there at that black line in the rings. That's called the Cassini division. And then they've had Saturn's big, far bigger than the Earth, and nearly 900 million miles away from the Sun. Well, that's my sketch. I'm afraid I can't compare with Voyager. And there's a Voyager picture of Saturn sent back in 1980. And again, you see the globe, the rings, and the Cassini division. But those rings are not so uninteresting as might be thought. In fact, we now know there are thousands of minor ringlets and narrow divisions. And just why that is so, we are not sure. And that's a Voyager picture of them. Well, Voyager has long since gone on its way. But we now can image Saturn with the Hubble Space Telescope. And here's a picture of Saturn taken with the Hubble telescope. And that bright patch in the middle is, in fact, a whirling storm upon Saturn's surface. And there again, you see the Cassini division. And that's named in honor of the Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini, who discovered it way back in the 17th century. And Cassini was a good observer, spent much of his life in the observatory of Paris, and also discovered several of Saturn's satellites. And Saturn has a whole family of moons. Here's one, an Voyager image, of one that Cassini discovered. That is Iapetus, half bright, half dark. And this one, Mimas, with one huge crater on it. Dione, with wispy features. Hyperion, shaped rather like a hamburger. Enceladus, with bright, sharp craters on it. But the most interesting one of all was discovered, not by Cassini, but by the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens, way back in 1655. And that is Titan. Now, here's a picture of Titan sent back by Voyager. It doesn't show very much. All you can see is the top part of what looks like, and is, a layer of orange smog. Because Titan, unlike any other satellite, has got a dense atmosphere, and the Voyager couldn't see through it. And Titan also is big, bigger than the planet Mercury. Well, here's another Voyager picture showing the edge of the atmosphere. But that's really about all. And we've never had any real idea of what Titan might be like underneath. Voyager didn't carry any equipment to penetrate that atmosphere. The Hubble telescope does to a certain extent, and it sent back pictures that does show something anyway. And there we can see that bright area on the left-hand side. We are not sure what it is. And as Titan rotates, that's brought in at a in better into view. But Titan really is a world of mystery. And that really is what we're hoping that Cassini-Huygens will solve for us when it finally gets there in the year 2004. Well, it may be some time to wait, but at least we have some preliminary impressions now. And at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back one of the principal scientific investigators, Dr. John Zarnecki. John, welcome back to the sky at night. First of all, what exactly is Cassini-Huygens meant to do? Well, I think we can divide the scientific aims into four main categories. First of all, we've got Saturn itself as one of the gas giants of the solar system. It has a complex uh, atmosphere with cloud system, weather patterns, and these will be studied by the onboard camera and the spectrometers on board Cassini. Then we have the ring system, the wonderful ring system, surely one of the, the wonders of the solar That's system. The um, now, something that we learnt about the rings from the Voyager mission was that they're not static and unchanging. We see, for example, here some strange shadowy features, the so-called spokes, mm -hmm. which seem to change on a fairly short time scale. And one of the, the benefits of the Cassini mission is that the orbiter will spend at least four years orbiting 
uh, Saturn, so it'll be able to study these, these spokes and hopefully track down exactly what, what it is that's causing them. Third, we've got the magnetosphere. Now, the magnetosphere is this region around Saturn where the planet's own magnetic field interacts with the magnetic field from the Sun, and it produces this very complex magnetized region. Once again, Cassini, during its orbit around Saturn, will be able to map out the magnetic structure of this magnetosphere. And then finally, we've got, of course, the satellites. 18, I think, at the last count, uh, though almost certainly there, there, there are more. Some are much too small for, for us to have detected them so far. And several of these will be flown by at fairly close distances by uh, the Cassini spacecraft. But there's one in particular, as, as you've said, Titan. That's the one okay. that really interests us. But we've got to remember that um, Saturn is a long way away. I mean, it takes over 29 years to go once around the sun alone. And how exactly is Cassini going to get there? That's, of course, a fascinating story in its own right. The problem here is that the Cassini spacecraft is one of the heaviest interplanetary probes ever to be launched. I think it's, it's only the, the, the Russian Phobos spacecraft was heavier. What this means is that with the sort of rockets that are available at the moment, it's not possible to launch it directly from the Earth to Saturn. So we have to use the by now quite well-known technique, the gravity assist, or sometimes called the slingshot effect, where you fly a spacecraft fairly close to a planetary body and essentially use its gravitational field to give the spacecraft an extra kick. Rather like going from Bognor to Brighton by way of Carlisle. Something like that, Patrick. <laughs> um, in this case, it's not Carlisle, but first of all, Cassini heads off in the direction of Venus. In fact, it goes in the wrong direction, towards the inner solar system. And the first gravity assist takes place there. Then there is, in fact, a second flyby of Venus. Now Cassini is really building up some some momentum, if you like, and in 1999, it flies by the Earth. At this point, then, it has sufficient energy to be moving out towards the outer solar system, and the final flyby is of Jupiter in the year 2000, and finally, then, uh, it reaches the Saturnian system in 2004. Now, what happens when it arrives? Well, initially, it actually has to pass through the ring system, and, yes. of course, it's targeted for one of the gaps in the ring system. Then, after uh, that passage, one of the most critical manoeuvres of the mission has to take place. This is the so-called orbit insertion, yes. where the onboard motor is fired for about 90 minutes. This takes place when the spacecraft is behind Saturn, when viewed from Earth, so we won't be able to monitor it in real time. And it's a critical manoeuvre, because if it's, it's not done just right, then the spacecraft will either be sucked in by Saturn's gravitational field, or it might pass out and, and, and never to be seen again. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Meanwhile, what about the Huygens lander? Well, during the interplanetary cruise, of course, Huygens is attached to the main Cassini orbiter. Once, though, the spacecraft, the combined spacecraft, is successfully inserted into the orbit around Saturn, then in fact, in early November 2004, the Huygens probe is separated. It's released from the spacecraft. It's released on a spring, in fact. Yes. And the two craft gradually separate from each other. But one of them, the Huygens probe, is on a collision course with Titan. And about three weeks after separating, it finally reaches Titan. What happens when it gets there? Well, the first problem is that its speed is something like seven kilometers per second. Yes. So how do you slow it down? Well, that's where the sort of characteristic flying saucer shape of the Huygens probe comes in. And what happens here is that the friction between the front shield of the probe and the top of Titan's atmosphere, that friction actually causes the probe to be slowed down. It gives the probe a fairly rough ride. There's a mm. tremendous heat generated in yes, that process, yes, but the shield protects uh, the Huygens. And after about two minutes of, of buffeting and being slowed down, the craft is moving at a speed of something like 500 meters per second. Now, at this sort of speed, you can then deploy a parachute. 
In fact, we have a sequence of three parachutes which are designed to, to ensure really that the probe takes about two and a half hours to gently float down to the surface. Now, it's during this two and a half hours that the onboard instruments, there's six scientific instruments in all, that's when they're doing much of their scientific work and taking their measurements. And then finally, we have the landing on the surface. Yes, and now comes the $64,000 question, John. What are we going to find on Titan? Absolutely, that's the big question. Well, let's consider the atmosphere first. We, in fact, know a reasonable amount about the atmosphere from the Voyager measurements. But Voyager was really only able to give us a sort of a global picture. What Huygens will do, as far as the atmosphere is concerned, is that it will make very detailed measurements at every point along the trajectory yes. as it descends. And it will measure with tremendous precision the composition of the atmosphere, of the gases that make up the atmosphere. It will tell us something about the particles that make up this smog, this haze that prevents us from seeing the surface from, uh, from the Earth. Uh, it will tell us, for example, about the density of the atmosphere, how that varies during the descent. It will look for lightning. Perhaps there is mm -hmm. lightning in the atmosphere. Could be. It will measure the temperature profile. We expect that to change considerably as the probe descends. In fact, initially, the, the temperature will drop, and then we expect it to rise again as the probe reaches the surface. What about the surface? Yes, that, what that about is it? That is big unknown. Well, it has been speculated, of course, that the surface of Titan might, can, might be the only other surface in the solar system where significant bodies of liquid exist on the surface. They might be puddles, lakes, seas, or even perhaps oceans. They certainly won't be oceans of water. For one thing, it's far too cold. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, we might call them chemical oceans. Th these are speculated to be um, oceans of ethane or methane, or perhaps a combination of the two. The reason uh, that I say methane is that we know that methane, which is one of the main constituents of the atmosphere, is actually lost yes. from the atmosphere. So there has to be a reservoir somewhere that can replenish what is lost uh, fr from the atmosphere. So that's one scenario, a liquid landing, but it might be a hard landing, there might be an icy surface, it might be a sort of a, a gungy surface where the, where the surface is covered with a, a, a sort of a tar or hydrocarbon goo, if you like. Um, it might be even more exotic. There might be geysers on the surface, um, ice-cold geysers, mind you. Or we might have a combination of all of these features. And in fact, we have on the probe, there is an onboard camera which will be uh, imaging the surface as the probe descends. And we might, as, as the probe descends, we might see all of these features. Well, let's hope that Huygens lands successfully, either splashes down or comes down upon solid ground. Now, how long is it going to be able to transmit before it's been put out of action or goes out of contact? That depends entirely on what it is that finally yeah. kills Huygens. And there are probably six ways in which, which the probe could finally die. It could, it could be damaged on landing, for example, because we don't know the nature of the surface. It's, it's difficult to design for, for every uh, possible scenario. It might freeze to death. Um, the temperature is something like minus 180 degrees centigrade. And though the probe is very well thermally insulated, that insulation might be damaged mm. during the landing. It might run out of power. The, the probe is, is powered by onboard batteries, which are in fact designed to give us up to 30 minutes on the surface. We could be very unlucky, and we could end up on the surface at, a, at an extreme angle. If that is more than 60 degrees, oh yes. then the, the link, the radio link from the probe on the surface to the Cassini orbiter, which is passing overhead, that could be lost. Um, if we end up on a, on a liquid surface, it's possible that there might be quite large waves, mm -hmm. and the waves could inundate the probe. However, if it survives all of those dreadful hazards, we do know that eventually that radio link, which I mentioned before, which will send, which will relay the data via Cassini back to the Earth, that will only last for about 30 minutes before the orbiter finally disappears over the horizon. So have only got, have got half an hour. But one thing strikes me, Cassini is actually going around Titan, and it'll come back. 
Now, is there any chance that Huygens can survive in an active mode for long enough to recontact Cassini when he comes back and put the link back? Unfortunately, there's no chance at all. Cassini's orbit around Saturn is something like 40 days long. So uh, it'll be 40 days before the orbiter reappears above Titan, and there's, ju there's just no chance that the probe can survive for that long in that very harsh environment. Well, now, what about possible life on Titan? Any chance? Well, people have speculated on that uh, many, many years ago. In fact, uh, Huygens himself, in his book, and we see the frontispiece here, The Celestial Worlds Discovered, which he published in the late uh, 17th century, he speculated on the existence of planets, of plants, animals, and even humans on the uh, planets of the solar system, the outer solar system. But we now know that the extreme temperature, the extreme cold, and the lack of oxygen means that the likelihood of, of life is, is really, uh, I would say, negligible. It's a pity, it's fascinating all the same. Now, it's a very complex probe. What do you think are the reasonable chances of success? You're right, it is very complex, and the hazards are very extreme, as is usually the case with space missions. But the reason that, on the whole, they are so successful is because of the enormous amount of testing that the spacecraft is, is put through before being launched. And Cassini is no different in this case. It's been shaken, it's been baked, it's been frozen, it's been spun around on a centrifuge, and it survived all of these tests it's also gone through a special test. Uh, in this case, this was the Huygens probe, or rather a model of it, which was taken up on a high altitude balloon here on Earth and then released in an attempt to simulate some of the events that will take place as it descends through Titan's atmosphere. And it came through this test, all of the parachutes worked well, the front shield was released, and it landed, uh, in fact, on, a, on an icy surface. Well, let's hope it all goes well. It will take some time to evaluate the results, won't it? It will indeed, though we get the results in, in, in late 2004 and we'll produce the first analysis fairly quickly. It'll be several years before all of the data is completely analysed and, and all of the last details squeezed out of it. And finally, what's the actual landing date on Titan? It's November the 27th, 2004. And will this year seen like this drawing by Richard Murray, or shall we do something entirely different? We can only wait and see. And on that evening, John, we will see you on the sky at night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our information line, 0891 800 30 or CFAX page 620. And also, it's newsletter time. And if you want your newsletter, then send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter number 67, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W1270S. And uh, when I come back next month, I'll be talking about instruments of change, new equipment used with our great telescopes. So until then, good night.